Chapter 9 Professor Slocum closed and bolted the long shutters upon his French windows. When his guests had seated themselves, he moved amongst them, distributing drinks and cigarettes. Sherlock Holmes lounged in a high leather-backed fireside chair and accepted a Turkish cigarette. My thanks, Professor, said he. I see that you still favour the same brand. The Professor smiled and seated himself. I think we have much to speak of, Sherlock. Your arrival here, although bringing me untold joy at the pleasure of meeting once more a noble friend, is, to say the least, a little perplexing. Holmes drew deeply upon his cigarette and blew out a plume of light blue smoke. It is a singular business, and no mistake. Pooley and O'Malley, who had been shaking their heads in disbelief and generally making with the rumbles of suspicion, gave the thing up and slumped in their seats sipping liquor. It all truly began, said Holmes, one foggy November night back in 1890. The previous month had been a successful one for me, having solved the remarkable case of the Naval Treaty and been more than adequately rewarded by Lord Holdhurst. I was experiencing a brief period of inactivity, and, as you will recall, such spells are no good to me. My soul has ever ached for the thrill of the chase, the challenge of pitting one's wits against some diabolic adversary, the blood coursing through the temples, the rushing of... Quite so, said Professor Slocum. Your enthusiasm for your work is well recorded. Upon this particular evening, however... Yes, well, Watson and I had, I recall, just partaken of one of Mrs. Hudson's most palatable tables of roast beef, and were setting towards consuming the last of a fine bottle of Vanbury's port, when there came a violent knocking upon our chamber's door. Probably the raven, said O'Malley sarcastically. To mind, said Professor Slocum. Holmes continued. I had heard no rappings upon the front door, and knowing that Mrs. Hudson was below in the kitchen was put immediately upon my guard. I had many enemies at the time, you must understand. I counselled Watson to open the door whilst I remained at my chair, my revolver upon my knee, covered with a napkin. Exciting so far, isn't it? said Pooley, yawning loudly. Riveting, said O'Malley. Holmes continued once more. The two figures who revealed themselves upon the door's opening were quite unlike any I have before encountered. I pride myself that I can accurately deduce the background and occupations of any man set before me, but these two left me baffled. They were tall and angular, with almond-shaped eyes and oriental features. When they spoke, I found their accents totally alien. Watson permitted them ingress into our rooms, and although they refused both food and drink, saying that such were impossible for them, what they had to say was precise and to the point. They had come from the future, they said, naming a year well in advance of this. The world they came from was vastly different from that I inhabited, but they were adamant in offering few details. They were perplexed by a problem of utmost import, which required the deductive reasoning of a mind their century did not possess. They had written their history books of my humble exploits, and felt I was the man to tackle the task. Was I willing? As you can imagine, I was more than doubtful, and demanded some proof of their claims. What they showed me was more than adequate to convince me they told no lie. So what are you doing here? asked Professor Slocum. You should surely be away into the future by now. No, said Holmes. You must understand that their sophisticated equipment enabled them to traverse the fields of time in an instant, but it was not possible for them to take a being from the past forward into the future with them. I would have simply crumbled to dust upon my arrival. They were more subtle than this. They arranged for a secret place to be built for me where I might be placed in suspended animation. They would then travel forward in their time-eliminating conveyance, and unearth and resuscitate me almost on the instant. Ingenious, said the professor, turning towards Sorb distant. How was I to know? complained Sorb. Well, said the professor, simply consider this a pleasurable stop-off along your journey. I think not, said Holmes. Mr. Distant here has broken the seal and disabled the means of my travel through time. 
Unless you happen to know of someone who can reset the apparatus, I would appear to be trapped. Professor Slocum scratched at his head. That might present some problems, said he, although there is always the thought that your visitors are already in the far future discovering your loss, and even now are setting back to search for you. Such is, of course, the case, but they might search for a century and not find me. What load of old nonsense, said O'Malley, suddenly rising from his seat. Come on, Jim, let's away to our beds. Pooley climbed to his feet. Be fair, Professor, said he. This is all a bit too much over the top. I know that the world is always ready and waiting for one more Sherlock Holmes story, but this is pushing credibility to the very limit. Do you doubt who I am? Holmes rose to his full height and stood glaring at the juice of doubting Thomases. Be fair, said Pooley. This is very far-fetched. You are, at the very least, extremely fictional in nature. I am as fictional as you, said Sherlock Holmes. Ha <laughs> ha, said Pooley. If you are the legendary doyen of detectives, answer me some questions. Proceed. All right, then. What are the thirty-nine steps? Wrong story, said John O'Malley. Ah, well, in the red-handed lake, Adity Knight Vincent Spalding was actually John Clay the murderer, thief, forger and smasher. By the white splash of acid on his forehead and his pierced ears. Who lost his hat and his goose in the blue carbuncle? Henry Baker. What was the Musgrave ritual? Who was it? He who is gone, who shall have it? He who will come. What is the month, six from the first, where is the sun over the oak? Where was the shadow? Right, 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 on the elm we know. Who was the Norwood builder? Jim asked. Jonas Oldacre. And the three students? Gilchrist, Donald Russ, and Miles McLaren. And the plumber engaged to Charles Augustus Milverton's housemate? Myself, said Holmes. Well, you could have read them. I always believed that Holmes really did go over the Reichenbach Falls with Professor Moriarty. Those later stories were the work of a standing, I thought. Bravo, said Holmes. You are, of course, correct. You must understand that a certain amount of subterfuge was necessary to cover my disappearance. My exploits were chronicled by Dr. Watson through an arrangement we had with a Mr. Conan Doyle. I left it to him to continue with the stories after my supposed death. Hang on said Pooley. Not that I can make any sense at all out of all this, but if you went below under the pretense of dying in the Reichenbach Falls, how could you possibly know about the Norwood Builder and the three students? That was four years later in the return of Sherlock Holmes. Ah, said that man. Ah, oh, indeed, said Professor Slocum. And Milverton's plumber. Detective's licence, Holmes suggested. I give up, said John O'Malley. Me also said Jim.